Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Rabbi syarah li sadri wa yisli amani wa halul uqdatan min lisani yafqahun qawli Amma ba'd So we refer back to the hadith regarding the question And that is when this ummah starts indulging in something called aina I mean, You could say it's like you know futures or you know certain types of uh, riba Interest based transactions And they become happy chasing the tail of cattle meaning they become happy chasing dunya, they chase wealth in this dunya. And they become pleased with agriculture. Agriculture is again, you know, just jobs. In this day and age, it refers to your food. All you care about is, you know, the homes, how nice your homes look, whether you got the latest, you know, carpets and cushions and sofas and this and that, whether you got the softest mattress, the plumpiest pillows. When this woman becomes happy with this and they leave jihad, then Allah himself will disgrace this ummah. Another thing we have to realize is that only Allah can break this ummah apart. As he says in Surah An'am, it's قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ إِنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابٌ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ That Allah is the only one who can send a punishment from above you. Whether it be bombs, whether it be anything else, stones from the sky, rains, hurricanes, whatever you call it. وَمِنْ تَحْتِ يَرْجُلِكُمْ Or from beneath your feet, be it natural disasters like her, uh, earthquakes, or anything else, or even humiliation. Because usually when we refer to a person being humiliated, then it's from beneath their feet, Allah is pulling them, or He is bringing them down, so then they are humiliated with the people. O yalbisakum shi'a, or He can break you into sects. Meaning this ummah itself, we cannot break into little sects. It is Allah alone who can split us apart. And Allah is the only one who could make you taste the violence of others. Allahu Akbar. Something we need to think about. Allah is the only one who has the power to cause harm to this ummah. Likewise, Allah He mentioned in Surah Anfal that وَلَوْ أَنْفَقَتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّا فَبَيْنَهُمْ If you have to spend all of the money in this life, you cannot unite the people in this ummah. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ Rather, it's for Allah alone to unite the people's hearts. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, okay, what's going to cause or bring about that result where Allah will unite our hearts? So like we were mentioning, when the people leave riba, when they stop you know, being happy, ch chasing their jobs, when they stop being happy just you know, working and putting food on their tables, and when they go back to jihad. So Rasulullah said that Allah will not lift the disgrace upon this ummah up until they go back to their deen. In this case, going back to their deen, it refers even to jihad. Allahu Akbar. And so up until this ummah is not willing to do that, nothing's going to happen. So that's the answer to the question. When is the support of Allah going to come? It's when you and I actually want the support of Allah. We're going to get together and we're going to go back to jihad, whether it be jihad or nafs. And it also is jihad of the tongue and also physical jihad. In this case, it would be defensive, right? So do you need permission? to do defensive jihad. There's two types of jihad. One is offensive jihad. What is offensive jihad? Invading another land on the request of a people. Let's say if a people come and complain to us that their leaders are oppressive and they are spreading injustice and corruption, then they would go and complain to the Muslims. The Muslims can then go to that land and then they can defeat those leaders so that justice can be spread across that land. But because we don't have a Khalifa then, there's no offensive jihad. Now you have defensive jihad. With defensive jihad, you don't need the permission of anybody. That's the simple answer. You don't need anybody's permission. And again, this is ed educational. I'm not telling you to go do anything. Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant us only good understanding. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to defensive jihad, you're going to defend the ummah. You're defending your brothers and your sisters. And so again, it's just something for us to ponder over. Allah will grant us the ability to do that. So right now, we haven't got the, the ability to even do that. We have to see it as Again, like we said, disgrace. You know, this ummah is so disgraced today that even if you do want to go and defend your brothers and your sisters, look at us sitting over here. Allah has humiliated us. He has not allowed us to even go and do something. What's the only thing you can do? Protesting. Allahu Akbar. It's not even prescribed in this ummah. That's the only thing we can do today. Look at the humiliation upon this ummah. Allah protect us and forgive us. And th what's going to change that again? Going back to the deen. Fixing our relationship with Allah. Rectifying our hearts. Studying the deen, you know, seeking knowledge because through seeking knowledge we can then adorn ourselves with all of the characteristics that Allah loves. 
and we can remove all of the evil characteristics from our heart that displeases Allah. May Allah grant us all a good understanding. Mm-hmm. Coming back to our topic, we are now on part three. For when we recite the surah in salah, how many of us can we actually follow along? We're understanding it. We know what Allah is telling us. What's the hikmah behind those ayat? Again, may Allah grant us all the ability to understand the Qur'an and have a close relationship with the Qur'an. And the story of Ibrahim salam, just to go over a few things as we already mentioned, it's all about perseverance. It's all about fulfilling the tests of Allah. And when Allah, He tested Ibrahim salam, Ibrahim with some tests and some words, فَأَتَمَّهُنْ He completed all of them. And again, it brings us back to the idea where Allah, He mentioned in the Qur'an, that this life, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلًا That you have been sent to this earth. Allah, He created death and life. Meaning you are put on this earth simply so that you may be tested. You know, this earth, this life of yours, think of it as a testing ground. Many of us, we think that we're going to be living for a long time. That we're here to enjoy the luxuries of, these, of this life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He mentions, you want to compare this life to the next. Take your finger and dip it in the ocean. The little drop that comes out, that's this dunya, whereas the ocean is the akhirah. What's the comparison there? What is the comparison there of this life compared to the next? Allahu Akbar. Yet, we look at the, everything around us, we absorb, you know, may Allah protect us. May Allah protect us from all the deceptions of this life and the deceptions of this dunya. And what we learn also through the stories of the Anbiya and all the believers also, is that when they are they have the correct mindset to navigate through this life, knowing that Allah is testing them. Whenever a difficulty comes to them, they know it's a test. So they turn back to Allah and they ensure that they are fulfilling their purpose. Again, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا Allah, He never created man and jinn except for one reason and that's to worship Him. And that's our test in this life also. If Allah places all the difficulties right on, in front of you, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop worshipping Him? Are you going to turn away? If Allah puts every single luxury in front of your face, what are you going to do? Turn away from Allah and stop worshipping Him. Allah, He mentions His people in certain places in the Qur'an also, you know, uh, from, from the people, women and nursi, they worship Allah like upon a string, He mentioned. The moment some good comes to them, they are worshipping Allah. The moment Allah decides to test them, they run very far away. Because they think Islam is all just about good. At the moment you believe in Allah, the true Lord, you submit to Rabbul Alameen, your life is supposed to be, you know, like a walk in the park, all roses and everything else. But no, Allah, He mentions that on the other hand, we have people who, when they are in difficulty, they turn to Allah. But the moment Allah relieves them, relieve them of their difficulty, they turn away from Allah. They start distancing themselves from Allah. And so we ask ourselves the question also, you know, how is my relationship with Allah today? You know, all here, we're all sitting, chosen by Allah to be here, to study His Qur'an. It's a good sign, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. But then the question again is, what we're going to do by the time we leave the masjid? Are we going to try and implement it? That's where the true favor lies. If we're just going to come into our ears now and leave, by the time we go, we leave the masjid, we forget about everything else, and that's not a good sign. Sometimes we see that amongst us over here, because whilst we're sitting here, we're not thinking of our own muhasab, of our own deeds and our own relationship with Allah. Some of us, we're sitting here, we're only thinking about dunya still. So again, may Allah perfect our intentions. For those who can remember their akhirah, and remember that, you know, that Yawm Al-Qiyamah is coming, that we're all going to be standing in front of Allah, whilst we're sitting here and trying to learn the deen and take knowledge, then for us, most likely, this knowledge will stay with us. But for those who couldn't be bothered, they just came sitting here. Again, you know, there's certain virtues in it, if you look into the sunnah. And so when we are striving, we find that Allah, He honors us through that. Allah, He mentions, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ hisab. That for those who bear patience, then for them is a reward that is unlimited. بِغَيْرِ hisab means that Allah is not going to do any hisab on the reward He gives. He's going to continue giving, giving, and giving up until you yourself, you say, Ya Rabb, that's enough. So whatever difficulty you take in your life, think about it. The biggest difficulty you've ever been through. How is Allah going to reward you for that? He's going to continue giving you up until you say, Ya Allah, that's enough. That's more than enough. That's what it means. That Allah, He will give these people. 
Innama, the, the meme is used over here, the meme alif. Innama means only those. Nobody else will have bighayri hisab as a reward. Allah is mentioning here in Surah Zumar. Only those who bear patience will have an unlimited reward. Allahu Akbar. So only the sabirun. So again, may Allah make us of them. Again, that doesn't mean that you ask Allah to, to send you difficulties so that you can be patient. If you look at your lives right now, if I look at my life right now, there are reasons we can be patient. If you're going through ease, you need to have patience so that you continue being persistent and consistent in your ibadah. You need to have sabr to stay away from sins. You need to have sabr to stay away from ma'asi, you know, all these things. And if you're going through a difficulty, it's much easier. You know how to have patience in a time of difficulty. You wait for the difficulty to go and you continue again being persistent and consistent in your ibadah. And so today as we begin, we go, we go over the idea and, you know, of, of the realization of Tawheed that Ibrahim السلام, he had from a very young age, as Allah he mentions in Surah Anbiya is, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْتَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ That from a very long time ago. Now this has two meanings. From the first is that Allah he mentions before Ibrahim السلام, at the beginning is Musa السلام, and Harun السلام, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَ بَهَارُونَ الْفُرْقَانَ وَضِيَاءً and لِلْمُتَّقِينَ and so when Allah, you, you continue with the ayat, then Allah mentions, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْتَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ Because Ibrahim came before Musa and Harun alayhim salam. So that's one of the meanings, is that before Allah gave the furqan and the diya and, and the dhikr to Musa and Harun alayhim salam, He already gave it to Ibrahim alayhim salam, or He already gave rushd. That's the first meaning. The second is that, Min Qabl could refer to Ibrahim Islam being young. That from the time reports say he was either seven years old and he was a young teenager when Allah He gave him this intellect and this maturity that he's able to see life correctly. And that's something we have to realize. You know, today even amongst the Ummah we have people, you know, we have certain, you know, sects in Islam having a ikhtilaf over what, you know, what is Tawheed. And literally, we're asking the question, some, some, some Muslims, they ask, they don't understand the concept of Tawheed. But Tawheed is not something new. Tawheed is literally the first thing man was taught. If you look from the time of Adam salam, the first thing he was taught was Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. And every single messenger, they were sent for that very same thing to remind the people to bring back Tawheed. وَمَا كَانَ النَّاسُ إِلَّا أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا That this, you know, mankind, was always one nation. We were one nation upon one religion, the religion of Tawheed. But then slowly shaitan, he came and he introduced shirk in the people's lives. Over time, people started worshipping idols. And so then Allah, he sent messengers to bring the people back. So Tawheed is not something new that now we need to be debating over you know, whether istighatha or making dua through the saints. Is it allowed or is it not allowed? Just look at all the anbiya before. Look at the same message that's been coming from the beginning of this life, from the beginning of mankind. Did they do that? No. Some people, they want to be asking the question, is istighatha through Rasulullah sallallahu allowed? Or tawassul through Rasulullah sallallahu Or tawassul through, you know, certain awliya? Well, look at the story of Nuh alayhi salam. That's the simple answer is no. Why? If, even if you look at Surah Yaseen. أَأَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِهِ آلِهَةً إِيُّرِدْنِ الرَّحْمَانُ بِضُرْ if Allah, Ar-Rahman, intends to harm you, can their shafa'ah help you in any shape, manner or form? No matter how close they may have been, you can go sit outside all of the Anbiya's qabrs today and beg them, do you think they will help you? No. Can they save you? No. Simple. Allah, he mentioned in Surah Zumar also, is those, the Quraysh, they took the idols in worship, and they said, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ We do not worship these idols. Rather, we, th we just take these idols as it means, like, you know, as shafa'a, to get us closer to Allah. لَزُلْفَ To get us closer to Allah. So we don't think that these idols truly have any power, but we think that they represent other, you know, powers that can help us get closer. Mm -hmm. Just like how today people, they will go to shrines thinking that these shrines can help them get their du'as answered. Intermediaries. Yeah, pre Pretty much, shafa'a or shufa'a, or you know, intercessors. May Allah protect us all from that. So again, you know, the simple idea. You know, some people they say, oh, you know, there's certain sects in Islam. It's like their version of tawheed is mixed up. Another person's version of tawheed is mixed up. Like, how can we be having an ikhtilaf upon tawheed? 
The very first pillar of Islam, La ilaha illallah. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. And again, you know, we can think about this. There's a dua that Rasulullah Sallallahu he taught us. And we say, Allahumma laka aslamt. O oh Allah, to you I submit. What are we saying at that point? That we submit to the fact that you, O oh Allah, you are in complete control of all affairs of life, including every single affair of my life. Everything that happens, Allah is in control of it. He decrees for it first. And he also helps guide you through whatever affair it may be. We submit to every command that Allah has revealed. Also realizing that every single law of Allah in the Sharia is good for you and I. Why is it good? Because he's a rahman is the simple reason. Allah told us, you know, he told sisters to ensure that you wear the hijab. There's khayr in it, that's why. Allah told men to lower their gaze. Also sisters, Allah told you to do something. There's khayr in it. So when you're saying, Allahumma laka aslamt, oh Allah, to you I submit. What are you exactly submitting to? You are submitting to Allah completely. Allahu Akbar. And then you say, wa bika amant. And in you I believe. Wa alayka tawakkalt. And upon you I place my trust. And today's topic is all about you know having complete trust in Allah the ayah that we're going to study next we'll see how you know the plan of Allah how it comes into effect and how Ibrahim Islam placed his trust in Allah but we'll get there but when you believe when you say I believe in you O Allah that we believe that you are Ar-Rahman the entirely merciful and caring that it, Allah is Al-Ahad also the only one and Al-Samad Al-Samad is the eternal and the ultimate authority meaning Nobody can show you any rahmah unless Allah gives his permission. That's a summit. Nothing can happen unless a summit gives his approval first. No calamity to, can touch you unless Allah he gives his, his approval first. He gives permission first for that difficulty to touch you. Likewise, again, when you say ar-Rahman, that la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, the idea of tawheed is that no mother can be merciful to you unless Allah allows them to. That's Tawheed. Again, realizing Tawheed. Ibrahim السلام, he realized this from the time he was young. Ibrahim min qabl. This guidance and this knowledge, it was with Ibrahim السلام, from the time he was young. Again, when you realize Allah is Al-Hakim also. So he's the only one who truly cares about you. He cares about your well-being in this life and also in the Akhirah. He's the one who wants to see you in Jannah. So every single thing that he makes you go through thereafter, is it actually good for you or bad for you? What's the answer? It's good because you, you know that your Lord is Al-Alim Al-Hakim also. He's the most wise. That he's only going to allow you and I to go through any difficulty if there's definitely good in it. If it's going to lead you to Jannah. Now you can be rest assured that Allah is not going to make you go towards Jahannam because he's Ar-Rahman. You know, it's, it's simple. Some people, you know, we think, oh, will Allah misguide me? SubhanAllah. Yes, we can end up being sent astray. But that's if there's kibber, etc., etc., in the heart. But for the vast majority who are sincere to Allah, we're just trying to, you know, do our best, be good Muslims, be good slaves with Allah. Then Allah grants us all a good understanding. Sometimes Shaytan he comes to you, he does this waswa. So, you know what? You're doing your bare minimum, the five salah, and maybe you do a little bit more than that. Then he comes and he tells you, you're not doing enough. Well, it's true that we can never worship Allah the way He deserves. But when it comes to not doing enough, the simple question is, are you trying? The answer is yes, right? So, inna rabbi la ghafuru shakur. Allah is the one who forgives and he's the most appreciative. So, we also have to have the correct hope in Allah. Again, may Allah grant us all a good understanding. We also went over how Ibrahim salam, he had the qalb salim. And this is part of also having rushd. That when you have the qalb salim, a qalb salim is a heart full of tawheed. Right? Because a qalb salim is something that is free of shirk. Something that is free of of all diseases, spiritual diseases, beginning with shirk and leading to all other things. Certain spiritual diseases that we can have is arrogance, which is the severe one, or hatred or anger. You know, those who have anger issues, usually in this day and age, when a person has some spiritual deficiency, if you go to the doctors, they'll say you have a disorder. Maybe you have an anger disorder. You're drinking and you're addicted to alcohol. You just have a drinking disorder. It's fine. Don't be guilty. Continue drinking. Not realizing actually it's your iman, it's your spirit, it's your ruh that's been corrupted and they need to do tazkiyah to nafs. They have eating disorders. Half the people today, our bellies are sticking out. When we come to the masjid also, subhanAllah, it's vulgar. It's vulgar at times. Some of the people standing, tying the thing, right, standing in front of the road, playing around with their trousers. Brother, not here. Do it before you come to the masjid. 
Sometimes we're standing when you come for tarawih. Also, you know, our bellies are sticking, we're burping this and this and that. And when you say, look, you need to discipline yourself. You need to be able to eat and control the amount you eat. They will say, no, 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 I've got this health issue, that health issue. I have to. If I don't eat three times a day, full big meals, then I'm going to lose my strength. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. Doctor said I have to eat seven times a day. You're telling me to eat twice a day. Doctor told me to eat full meals. You're telling me to eat, what, just one third? Come on. And so then we see people, many other people who are overweight. You know, we cannot even say this today. If you call a person and say, look, you're overweight, you need to lose it. Oh, that's it. You're being discriminatory. Uh, this is equality. This is against the law now. You're too rude now. But what's the thing? You know, before, if a person had a fat belly, at least he was honest about it. You know what? I can't control the amount I eat. Simple. That's the simple truth. I cannot discipline myself. It's a weakness on my own self. It's my own weakness. I ask Allah to forgive me. At least then he can repent for it. And then slowly he can try to discipline himself. But if now, is, if everything's a disorder, what's going to happen? The entire world is in disorder today, right? The entire world is in disorder today. And so for every single issue we have, we need to go back to the heart. Is it actually the heart? You'll find that for majority of the issues that we have, 99% of them, the issue is the heart. If the heart is truly salim, if we truly have the qalb salim, then we have no issue in our lives. Again, may Allah protect us. And that's why, you know, it's a constant thing of tazkiyah to nafs. Every single time we commit a sin, a black dot is placed in the heart. If we do not give it up, then that blackness is spread. Our hearts become diseased. And then we start getting all these disorders. And we start getting all these anxiety things. And then all of the other disorders that come from that anxiety, the simple answer is, no, you need to clean your heart. You need to do tazkiyah to nafs. But the people, they're not willing to do that. And so they go further and further into it. May Allah protect us. There are also genuine cases of actual depression where you know people they are afflicted with it and this is something that's also within the power of Allah. You know, Allah is, he is able to do all things. However, what we do say that whilst there are certain cases where people they truly, you know for example PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder is a real thing. You know, people they see dead bodies right in front of them, people who go to war they see all these things, it affects them, it's a real thing, it's there. Because human beings were not naturally made to see such things. I'm, I'm not surprised people, you know, they looking at what's happening in Gaza today. You know, I'm expecting tomorrow they will say, look, I've been afflicted with PTSD, what should I do? I won't be surprised if people do that to me tomorrow. I won't be surprised if people say tomorrow, after looking at all these pictures, I've become deranged in my mind a little bit. May Allah protect us though, may Allah protect us. But it's a reality. So Allah can afflict whomsoever He wants with anything that He wants. But we do say that for every disease there's a cure. As Rasulullah Sallallahu said, and the cure is to scare to nafs, going over your heart. Again, may Allah grant us all a good understanding. So, just to do a quick recap, we mentioned from ayah number 51 to 56 is, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْتَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَاكِفُونَ Again, we went over the tafsir of this last week, so we won't go over it again. وَقَالُوا وَجَدَنَا آبَاءَنَا لَهَا عَابِدِينَ قَالَ لَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَآبَاؤُكُمْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ قَالُوا أَجِئْتَنَا بِالْحَقِّ أَمْ أَنْتُمْ مِنَ اللَّاعِبِينَ قَالَ بَلْ رَبُّكُمْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرُضِ الَّذِي فَطَرَهُنْ وَأَنَا عَلَى ذَلِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاهِدِينَ Now he said, after they had this initial debate, when, he, when they said, قَالُوا أَجِئْتَنَا بِالْحَقِّ أَمْ أَنْتُ مِنَ اللَّاعِبِينَ that Have you come to us with the truth or are you just playing about? In other words, they didn't want to take him seriously because he was a little child. How could a little child come and tell us that we were astray and our fathers and our you know, parents before us were all astray? Rather, he's the one who clearly, you know, he's just a little child. He cannot think yet. So, and then he responds saying, قَالَ بَلْ رَبُّكُمْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَلَّذِي فَطَرَهُنْ That your Lord is he who created the heavens and the earth. فَطَرَهُنْ He originated everything. وَأَنَا عَلَى ذَلِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاهِدِينَ And I am to that, I bear witness. وَتَاللَّهِ لَأَكِيدَنَّ أَصْنَامُكُمْ بَعْدَ أَن تُوَلُّ مُدْبِرِينَ He says, which is, and by Allah, he makes an oath upon Allah, لَأَكِيدَنَّ أَصْنَامُكُمْ That I'm going to plan against your idols بَعْدَ أَن تُوَلُّ مُدْبِرِينَ When you have turned your backs away. فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ جُذَاذًا And so he made all of them into little pieces. جُذَاذًا إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ Except the biggest of their, what happened here? Except the biggest of their idols. 
لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرْجِعُونَ So that they might return to it. What does that mean, that they might return to it? Of the meanings given in the tafsir is that when they return to it, they will return to questioning him. And also rather when they return to it, it can also mean that once they, re they realize, they can return to Allah. But from this, number one is that we see, you see, Allah is Allah's plan from the beginning. He gave Ibrahim alayhi salam rushd, you know, the sound intellect, guidance from a very young age. From the very get-go, we need to realize first that this was Allah's plan. This was Allah's plan from the start and he was just guiding Ibrahim alayhi salam along. This was not his plan, Ibrahim alayhi salam's plan, nor was it their people's plan. And so this is something we also need to be asking Allah for ilm. Allahumma in yas'aluka ilma. Ask Allah for rushd. Ask Allah you know, to make firm our evidences also, like how we made it firm for Ibrahim alayhi salam, so that we may be able to stand up for Tawheed also, you know, just like how Ibrahim alayhi salam did. That doesn't mean that we go breaking things. But when he mentions, that I'm going to plan against your idols, after he debated with them, what happens? They refuse. So if words don't work, what comes next? Action. You need, sometimes you need something practical to be able to show the people. Again, this is something that we have to think about, you know, to have a long-term plan, to be able to bring the people, even in this society, away from all the tawhut that we have today. Again, may Allah grant us solely good understanding. And so Abu Ishaq, that when the people of Ibrahim, السلام, they went out to celebrate their festival. That is when, you know, they asked Ibrahim, السلام, to come with them, and he said, I'm sick. Again, this is one of the times where, you know, it comes across as though he's saying that I'm sick, I'm physically sick. But what he meant was that, you know, I'm sick and tired of this idol worship. So, so for those who say that this was a lie, it actually turned into a white lie. Again, this is a white lie is a big topic in itself, which we can go over another time. So he said, I am sick. And this was only the day before the actual festival. And this was all part of his plan because after when they were all going to go, we'll find out what happens next. So Allah, he caused some of the people to hear this. That, you know, he said that I'm going to plan against your idols. Allah, he caused some of the people to hear this. And it's all part of the bigger plan of Allah as we're going to explain. So through that person or through them, Ibrahim Islam, he was going to be revealed by the people. That once, you know, they come back and they see the idols broken down and they see only one remaining. Allah would cause some of them to remember that actually there was this young boy named Ibrahim who was saying that, you know, he's going to plan against the idols. And thus, the established or, you know, the evidence would be established either for them or against them. And something we also need to realize is that, you know, from this is that Allah, he never misses any detail. You know, there's so much of hikmah in this that when Allah, he mentions, فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ That he broke all of them down except the biggest one in another place in the Quran. He used his right hand to strike it. فَضَرْبًا بِالْيَمِينَ he struck it with his right hand. Why would Allah mention the specific of using his right hand in the Quran? It just goes to show that, you know, Allah is al al khabir that he knows every single detail. In this, for you and I, there's shifa in this. That he knows every single thing that you and I are going through. There's nothing, nothing misses Allah. Again, as part of usul al-tafsir, is that your lesson in the Quran is from the general wordings of the Quran. What you understand from the Qur'an, you can think about it, you can ponder over it. But that does not mean that it is the actual interpretation of the Qur'an. When it comes to the ta'wil or the tafsir, the interpretation of the Qur'an, then you have to follow usul. And following usul means that first and foremost you see what did Rasulullah say about it. What did the Sahaba say about it? What did their students, the tabi'un, say about it? What did the scholars of ijtihad say about it? And then you, make, you take your interpretation following that. You get people who they don't follow usul, they want to interpret the Qur'an based on their own opinions. Rasulullah said for them, you know, they can take their seat in Jahannam. Whoever tries to interpret the Qur'an using their own opinions, they want to say that this is what Allah said, but you haven't done usul or anything as such. This is a dangerous thing to do. Again, may Allah protect us all from it. And so Allah, he continues to say, that when they came back and they saw all of their idols broken down, except the biggest one, they said, Allahu Akbar. That, you know, who has done this to our idols? Indeed, he is definitely a spiteful person. Or, إِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ He is definitely one of the wrongdoers. Number one is, look at the moral corruption of such individuals 
that they call a person who breaks an idol a wrongdoer وَهُمْ بِذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَنِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ But they are turning away from Ar-Rahman himself. Allah, he mentions earlier in Surah Anbiya, قُلْ مَنْ يَكْلَؤُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَنِ Who is it that can protect you by night and by day from Ar-Rahman? We went over the two meanings. The first one is from Allah. So if Allah has to send some punishment to you during the day or during the night, who can protect you from it? Nobody. Nobody except Allah himself. And the other meaning is other than Allah. So who can protect you by night and by day other than Allah? Allahu Akbar. So again we find Allah is the only one who can punish you. Allah is the only one who can protect you. Which is why, you know, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Flee to Allah. You f you're running away from Allah to Allah. How do you make sense of that? How do you run away from Allah to Allah? So قُلْ مَا يَكْلَأُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَانِ So who can save you by night or by day other than Allah? They don't realize this, but when somebody comes and breaks the idols, which is completely powerless, as they themselves will prove it with their own words soon, then they say, oh, that person who breaks the idols is a wrong doer. You know, such moral corruption is beyond description. You know, to even try and think about it, like, how does it even make sense? Like we mentioned last time, to say or to claim that the creator needs to be created. Does it make sense? How can it make sense? The creator needs to be created. Because this is what they claim with the idols. That now, you know, the creators are creating that idol and they're calling the idol the creator, the God. How does it make sense? You know, linguistically also, it doesn't make sense. The concept, rationally, it doesn't make sense. But the hearts were so black, the hearts were so filthy and filled with arrogance that they simply could not see it. So. When they said, Man fa'ala hadha bi alihatina, you know, who has done this to our gods? Number one, the proof is now already established. Number one, what do we mean by proof? Number one, what they said, you know, Man fa'ala hadha bi alihatina, who has done this to our gods? Knowing that these, these gods were created from stick and stone, they have no power at all. These people knew this. These people, they saw that. You know, they were all broken in pieces. It's written down in their book of records. That's the first thing. So now the evidence against them is established on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Now if these so-called idols were true gods, then they would defend themselves, right? The simple thing is, they would defend themselves and their people, and they couldn't do that. So the evidence, as you and I can see now, is that this is Allah's plan. The evidence is there, it is recorded in their book of deeds, it is recorded in the Qur'an, it is recorded in Lawh Al-Mahfuz, that they themselves said it. When they said, Man fa'ala hadha bi alihatina, who has done this to our gods, that in itself is, again, a statement that doesn't make sense, so now it's written against them. May Allah grant us all a good understanding. And then it continues, you know, when they said that we heard a young boy named Ibrahim, he mentioned these gods. So this is the very next ayah. We, know, we heard Fatan. Fatan is like a young, a very young boy or an early teen. You know, Yathkuru, they, they were, he, he was speaking about these gods يُقَالُوا لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ They call him Ibrahim you know, قَالُوا فَأْتُوا بِهِ عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِ النَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْهَدُونَ So bring him before the eyes of the people so that everybody may bear witness and subhanAllah again evidence, more evidence is being established and why do we use this more evidence is being established number one is Allah He makes mention in Surah Taha something we need to understand Part of the reason why we are in this dunya and part of the reason why we are being tested is if Allah, He created us and if He put the wrongdoers in Jahannam straight away, what would have happened? They would say Allah is unjust, correct. So if, when Allah created all of us and He already knew who the wrongdoers were, He already knew who, no matter how much you tell them, no matter how much reminders and messengers you send them that they will never accept the truth, that they will always just want to commit their sins and disobey. He already knew who they were because Allah is Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. He has complete knowledge over all things. But if he put them in Jahannam immediately, then they would have said, as mentioned in Surah Taha, right near the end, is that, oh, our Lord, why didn't you send to us a messenger first? Why didn't you give us a chance first? Why didn't you see first whether we'd actually obey you or disobey you? And then why didn't you send us reminders you know, let's say if you were to put us on earth or on a place where we could be given a chance, then you can send to us messengers who would remind us to do the good thing. Why didn't you do that? This is what they would ask. So that's why the evidence is established against their own selves, that they actually were sent to this dunya, they were given the chance, they were sent messengers to remind them of the good and to 
tell them to leave the sins and they didn't want to do it. So again, evidence is established against them. Which is why on Yawm Al-Qiyamah Allah, He mentions, nobody has any excuses. بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَاذِيرًا That on that day, mankind will testify against himself. Again, we were mentioning earlier on disorders, right? We don't actually want to admit the truth. If you're overeating, you know that you just need to eat less. But people, they don't want to do this. They want to say, no, you know what? Everything else. The food tastes too nice. <laughs> so I just continue eating. <laughs> this is actually something that I've come across. Why don't you eat less? It tastes too nice. My wife cooks too good food. I said, she dishes out. And she dishes out. I say, stop, that's enough. But she continues dissing out. So I'm like, how can I say no then? If I say no, she will feel bad. If I say no, she will feel bad. And then tomorrow she won't cook for me. So yeah, if she overfills my plate, I have to eat it anyway. Every single man will testify against himself. Your hands will speak against you on that day. Half of us, we'd love nothing but to say, it's the wife's fault. It's the wife's fault. Whatever it is, it's the wife's fault. But Allah is saying here, no, you're going to testify against yourself. In this, you can throw us all, all the excuses you want. Disorder this and disorder that. But you're going to testify against your own self. Your hand is going to speak against you. Your eyes are going to speak against you. Everything is going to be speaking against you. There's only one thing that will speak for you on that day. What is that? The Quran. So are you unfamiliar with it then? The only thing that will speak for you on Yom al Qiyamah is the Quran. But you don't understand it when we're reciting in Salah yet? What's going on there? Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us all a good understanding. Yeah. The Quran is one of the only intercessors, you know, for us. Obviously, this is after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's true. It's true. Again, we know that there are some people, they recite the Quran and the Quran just curses them. May Allah protect us. It's a dangerous thing. These are the people who wouldn't try to implement it in their life. They wouldn't understand it. You know, maybe they've memorized it, but they're not making any effort to understand it and to live by it. They just, you know, recite it. Once a year, Ramadan comes, they open the Qur'an, they start reciting it. After Ramadan ends, they shut the Qur'an, put it away, it gathers dust. Again, may Allah protect us. Let us continue. So after Ibrahim salam, he was brought in front of the people. Again, this was his ultimate plan, as mentioned in the tafsir, that this was his ultimate goal, that he wanted to have a large crowd so that he could prove to all of them after his physical demonstration that these gods were not true gods and that they had to worship Allah alone. But as we mentioned, tawakkul and knowing that this is the plan of Allah, that it was actually Allah's plan. You know, the ultimate plan was Allah's plan to establish the truth. Then, then they can either accept or they can actually reject it. And we find that this is exactly what happens. So Allah, he continues to say in the next ayah is that when they brought him forth, they ask him, did you do this to our gods? Ya Ibrahim. And they said, he said, That rather, you see the big one there? You know, he's the one who did it. Because what Ibrahim did, he left a giant hammer you know, on the hand of that idol. So he said, look, there's that idol there. Clearly he's the only one. Clearly he felt jealous of all the other idols. Maybe you were giving them some attention and not him. So he broke them all down. So go and ask that big idol mentioned that you know they lowered their heads. The first meaning given is that they lowered their heads in shame because at that moment they realized that okay, first and foremost, we cannot ask that big idol. He can't speak. <laughs> Clearly, we haven't been doing the right thing here. Clearly, we haven't been worshiping, you know, the Almighty, and we've actually taken these idols in falsehood. They realized this. And they said to their own self that you are the wrongdoers. Meaning they owned up to their own folly. They said, actually, I'm wrong. Inside they're saying, look, I'm wrong. Because clearly I can see that these idols, they don't listen. They don't speak. They cannot help me. And I still took them in worship rather than the one who made me. Clearly, Ibrahim, little seven-year-old child, is right and we're wrong. So they had this moment of truth with their own selves. And there's also given another tough seed where they actually turn to each other and they start fighting, saying, no, you are the wrongdoers because you didn't defend your gods. Again, how can it be that the created has to defend the creator? Even in that case, when they were arguing with one another and saying, look, you're the wrong one because you weren't defending it. Even then, it's like, whilst they're saying that, they know how stupid it is. They know how you know, pathetic it is to even blame one another for that wrongness because it just doesn't make sense. So at that moment, when they're checking their hearts, they're looking within, فَقَالُوا إِنَّكُمْ أَنْتُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Actually, you are the wrongdoers. 
you know that you're doing this sin and that's when the kibber, the kibber kicks in. So when they don't want to admit it, how can a seven-year-old child be right and we are wrong? So then they turn around and they turn back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And at this moment, they could have repented. This is how Allah establishes the truth. Again, knowing how Allah, he, he uses these situations to establish the truth. This is Allah's plan from the start. And Ibrahim alayhi salam was just guided to do that which Allah wanted him to do. But Allah is always in control. And that's something we also have to realize. Again, Allah is always in control. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Is that nothing changes, nothing moves, nothing has any power except with Allah. You don't have power to do ibadah. Did you know that? Yeah. You don't have the ability to worship Allah. Illa billah. Unless Allah he enables you to do so. Which is why every single time for adhan, when you get to hayya ala salah, come for salah. What do you say? Because at that moment you're acknowledging that, Ya Allah, the Mu'addin is saying, come for salah, hayya ala al-falah, come for falah, or come for success rather, I cannot do it. You're saying, Ya Rabb, I cannot come for salah, and I cannot come for success, unless you enable me to do so, you guide me to do so, you remove all obstacles between me and that salah. That's what you're saying when you say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Again, complete tawakkul in Allah. This is, you know, it opens the door to complete trust in Allah. When you realize that you cannot stay away from any sin, unless Allah enables you to do so, it helps you place your trust in Allah correctly and you ask Allah to keep you away from those sins. Likewise, when it comes to your ibadah, you want to wake up on time for fajr? You want to wake up a little bit earlier for tahajjud? What makes you think you can wake up for tahajjud? Tahajjud is invite only. Have you heard that before? Tahajjud is invite only. Nobody wakes up for tahajjud unless Allah gives you a special invite to share some moments with Him during those precious moments when you and him are as close to each other as you could ever be, especially in that moment of sujood. Allahu Akbar. And that just reminds me, may Allah wake us up with tahajjud tomorrow. May Allah bless us all with tahajjud. When you think about it, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu he mentions that in the last day of the night, Allah, he, defend, uh, he descends in a manner that befits his majesty to the first heaven. It's the only time usually. And in another narration, he mentions that when you place your forehead in the ground in sujood, it's as close as you could be to Allah. So when you think about it, again, in the last third of the night, when you go into sujood, what is it? You and Allah are as close to each other as possible. And what's the first reason you do tahajjud? We can answer, what's the first reason you wake up for tahajjud? Closeness to Allah, correct. Rasulullah Wasallam said, you know, it's that which brings you closer to Allah. And the ulama, they said that they have not found any deed in the Quran or the Sunnah that brings you closer to Allah than Salat al-Tahajjid. Allahu Akbar. So may Allah wake us all up for Tahajjid. That means we're all going to have to sleep early. No scrolling up until 12 o'clock midnight. But okay, let us continue, inshaAllah. SubhanAllah, it's another thing. Look at Rasulullah Wasallam. How long did he sleep? Today we have science telling you that you need to have at least a good eight hours sleep to be healthy. Look at how much the Anbiya slept. How much did Rasulullah Wasallam sleep? Yet nobody did more than him. And he was still the strongest and the healthiest of the people. Baraka. Baraka. That's Baraka. Likewise, how much did he eat on a daily basis? If they're telling you you need to have three full meals a day in order for you to grow up as healthy and strong. Actually, look at the Baraka in it first. How, how much did Rasulullah Wasallam eat? There were times when they would see two full moons, which refers to two months where nothing would be lit in their home. No, no stove, no, no fires. What would they be eating? Dates and water. Dates and water. That's what they would be eating. At times Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would go to his wife's house, he would ask, is there anything to eat? She was like, no, I'm fasting today. That's how it would be. If there was nothing in the house to eat, he would be fasting. If there was something there, then he would actually break his fast and eat it. This was a constant with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Even more, he asked Allah for this. When Allah offered to give him gardens and palaces and everything to make him a king in this life, what did he say? No, I'd rather be a humble slave. It's mentioned also in other narrations that from that moment when he was offered this and he chose to be a humble slave, even the way he used to eat thereafter, he used to always sit upright. So before that he would relax, he would lie down maybe or he would lean back and he would eat his food. But from that moment when he made the choice, that he will be a humble slave to Allah rather than being a king. From that moment onwards, even whilst he was eating, his back, he would keep it straight. Like a humble slave. 
something that we all have to try and do, inshallah. May Allah grant us all the ability to do so. And so the evidence, uh, coming back, the evidence is for entire mankind. The plan of Allah. Again, think about it. The hikmah of Allah. This one event that's happening so long ago. It must be just during that time with a seven-year-old child. But that evidence that happens there is established for us to benefit from today. That is the hikmah. That is the plan of Allah. When Allah plans things, it's not just for today, or for tomorrow, or for the next year. You know, it's something that benefits all of mankind thereafter. Such is the hikmah of Allah. That just from this one thing, you know, ask that one God, that big one there, if he can. And Allah, he recorded in the Quran how, how they looked within. But their kibr stopped them from accepting at that point. So they turned back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then they said, you already know that he can't speak. Hmm. You already know that they can't speak. Now the evidence is there. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam, this is what, exactly what he wanted. The entire city is listening. They can see the folly themselves. Some may think, okay, you know what? They may realize it. And this is why sometimes, you know, the entire community can be corrupt. Because now when he says, Qala afata'abuduna min dunillah, so how then can you worship other than Allah? Ma la yanfa'ukum shay'an wa la yadurrukum that cannot benefit you and it cannot harm you. Uffil lakum wa ni ma ta'abuduna min dunillah. So uff to you. you know, it's, it's an expression of just frustration to you and to everything that you worship besides Allah. Afala ta'aqilun. Can you not use your brains? To put it simply, don't you have an aql to use? Afala ta'aqilun. Can you not reason? Clearly you just looked within. You are already admitting to yourself that this is folly. You cannot ask the big idol because it cannot speak. How then can you ask for help from that which cannot speak? But they knew this. They still denied this. What did they say instead? That no, now you have to help your gods. So go and prepare a big fire. Go and prepare a big fire so that you can help your gods and punish Ibrahim salam and set an example for the people. So we're not going to finish the story today. This was just part three. But regarding what we need to learn is that Ibrahim salam, he was given victory from Allah, meaning this was Allah's plan from the start. So him going and debating with his people, this was the plan of Allah. Allah was guiding him and navigating him through it. You and I, we need to live like this. Ya Allah, you know, guide me. When you say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Guide me onto the straight path. The path of those whom you have bestowed your favor. What you're doing, like we mentioned, the very first dua we mentioned, Allahumma laka aslamt, is that you're submitting to complete powerlessness, that you are completely powerless. You don't have any power whatsoever. After that, once you have acknowledged that you have no power, and then you turn to Allah, seeking guidance, seeking His aid, and asking Allah everything that you want from Him, that is how you get your duas accepted, by the way. By acknowledging la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And then you look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, again, look at Allah's plan. So the debate that he gave him and how he used his words, how he debated with his father, how he debated with his people, and how then when he did his practical sort of demonstration, he broke those idols, and then his people came back. This was Allah's plan all from the start. Allah caused those people to hear him so that he would be brought in front of the people. Allah is the one who gathered all of them over there. And Allah is the one who guided him to use the very words that he used. And that's something we have to remember. Allah's plan. We'll continue the tafsir next week on Saturday, inshaAllah.